Hello. How are you guys doing? It is 2.24 a.m. and I looked much nicer earlier tonight. Went on a little double date with my husband and Melissa and Jason and we had a really good evening. I've now opted for this Sun Bum Chapstick lip, lip Balm instead of all of the high-end bougie ones that I'm almost out of. It's really nice, actually. So I brought it with me to put in my car, to leave in my car. I'm trying not to have a bunch of crap in my car because in my like last couple cars, I always just had so much junk everywhere. Like my car was clean. Like if you got in it, it looked really clean. Like I think you guys know by now. We're like hearing from Tanya and people that it's like I like to have my car very clean. But like down, like you know, in here in the middle thing, I always just have a bunch of stuff I didn't need or in the glove compartment, and I just don't want to have a lot of that. Um, I just want to only have a few things, which is why I'm trying to really use the fanny packs. So anyway, yeah, we went to dinner, and uh, let's see my day. My day, my day. I got up today and um, went and met with a sober friend of mine and had coffee, and we had a good time. That was fun. There are, like, currently, here, I'll show you in case you live somewhere warm and you've never seen this. Um, there's, like, do you see this truck right here? So they're salting the roads. I don't know if you can see the road, but they're salting the roads. Um, cause we're supposedly supposed to have an ice storm followed by a snowstorm, And it's supposed to start here, uh, between four and five in the morning. So I'm, I was really excited because we were supposed to have a blizzard supposedly. We were supposed to get like eight to 12 inches of snow. They've now changed that to three to five inches of snow, but like two inches of ice before that. And, um, if you've never driven on ice before, it's extremely scary. And, um, tomorrow we're supposed to have, it's, it's not that cold out, 32 degrees outside. It feels, it's okay outside. It's not like super cold. Um, we're supposed to have a mix between snow and ice. And ice is always like horrible here because it just like takes down the power lines, takes down the cable lines. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if a lot of power goes out in Indianapolis tomorrow. Alex has some meetings that he's supposed to go to in the morning. I was like, baby, you should see if you could reschedule these things. Anyway, um, so I got up and I went and had coffee with a sober friend of mine that I hadn't seen for a while. We had a good time. Um, met for a couple, like an hour and a half, two hours was nice. And then um, I went and ran some errands and I have been listening to um, the Stranger Beside Me by Ann Rule about Ted Bundy, because it's the book for the book club, and I got really into it today, and um, I kind of just like lost track of time. <laughs> and by the time I got home, it was like from running errands and doing stuff, it was like 5.30 in the afternoon, and I was like, you know what? Like, I was like rushing to set stuff up, because I really wanted to make some videos today, and I was like, Peter, don't rush to make videos. Just make videos tomorrow. So. Um, I've got all my videos planned out for tomorrow that I'm going to do. And then, yeah, and then that was that. And then I was kind of just hanging out at the house, feeding the dogs, doing stuff like that. And Melissa texted us, and she was like, we had a group text, and she was like, do you guys want to go have dinner tonight? And we were like, yeah, sure. So Alex got done with work about 8, so we had planned to meet at 8.30 um, to go to dinner. We were going to Cheesecake Factory. And... We got, the heat is like, in this car, is so fantastic. It like goes from like being freezing to like really warm, like in just like literally like a minute or two. Um, the, ste the heated steering wheel is, and the heated seats are fantastic too. But anyway, um, so like they got there before me. Well, Alex had a really bad headache, so I had already left the house. And so I stopped at the gas station to get him some leave. Um, cause he had asked me to bring him some and I had already left. So, um, I stopped and got him some leave. 
And then they had gone to Cheesecake Factory and there was an hour and a half wait. So they were like, do you want to go to Maggiano's? So we went to Maggiano's and apparently there was a really long wait there too. But like Alex got online and like scheduled reservations for us. So we only had to wait a couple minutes. But, um, and we had a really nice dinner. We sat there for like almost, th like we sat there, we got there at like, um, 8.40. We left like right at 11. So almost, I don't know, two and a half hours, something like that. We had a really fun time and talked about, kind of just caught up because we hadn't really seen them a whole lot since New Year's. Um, and we are going over to their house for dinner on Sunday night. Um, Melissa is like making chicken chili. And so she's like, you guys should come over on Sunday night. It's just going to be us. I'm going to make chicken chili. Jason wants to watch a football game and then we can watch like a scary movie or something. Because <clears throat> we used to go over there like every other week and watch like a scary movie at their house and stuff. And she's like, and just let me know if I can, what I can make you or whatever. And I was like, Melissa, you don't even have to make me anything. Don't even worry about it. I was like, I'll just bring some hummus and some, you know, chips or something like that. She's like, no. She was like, let me make you something. She's like, I can, I can make a, like a gourmet grilled cheese. And Alex was like, oh, Peter would love that. I was like, yeah, I would love that. So she's going to make me a gourmet grilled cheese. Um, and then they're going to have chicken chili. So that'll be, I'm kind of excited about that. And I don't know what a gourmet grilled cheese is, but maybe just different kinds of cheese or apples or something. I don't know. It'll be fun. And I was like, we were talking about the, the year of the blizzard that we had to go over there and stay. And Melissa was like, um, she was like, do you, um, she was like, we could do a blizzard tonight. You want to do a blizzard tonight? And I was like, no, cause like the weather hasn't hit. She goes, well, if it's bad tomorrow, I think you guys should come over for a blizzard. Cause like Melissa and I loved the blizzard. Alex and Jason, so much, it wasn't so much like they were, I mean, they had fun, but it wasn't. So the blizzard, I talked about this on here not too long ago, was when we had to go over there and stay because our electricity was out. And um, so, yeah, it was really fun. So Melissa's like, well, if the power goes out tomorrow, she was like, we're going to have a blizzard. Now now what we call it, this like event, right? Like this blizzard. So she's like, if the, if the power goes out tomorrow for you guys, and then Jason goes, well, what if the power goes out at our house? And Alex is like, well, you guys can come over and stay at our house, but we just don't have like an extra, you know, like the, the bedroom and like the big couches like you guys do. And she's like, her parents just moved down here and built a house. Um, they, they moved down here like a year, two years ago maybe. And they built like a really nice house and she's like oh, my parents have a generator at their house so we can go to my parents house and we can all have a blizzard there <laughs> and she's like and we can make cookies and stuff <laughs> Melissa's so cute we had a good time our waitress our waitress was fantastic and she came up to me it was so funny because she came up to me and she goes um we were like talking to her uh forever tonight she was so nice and so like halfway through dinner she comes up to me up, comes up to me and she goes so I didn't know that you were YouTube famous and I go what and she goes and I didn't know that you were YouTube famous and Melissa goes every time we're out you always get noticed by somebody okay I like nobody ever comes up to me right and ever says like oh do you make YouTube like this never happens like ever 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 like it happens to Alex more than it happens to me they'll be like I watch your husband's videos but like it never happens to me and whenever I'm with Melissa like that's when it happens <laughs> and she's like this always happens when I'm with you so anyway, I was like, no, I said, I just make YouTube videos. I said, it's kind of a joke and whatever. She goes, well, we have a waitress here and she's like going crazy back there. She's been stalking you all night long. She's been like walking past your table. I hadn't even noticed it. And she's like, she's been walking by your table because she's like, oh my God. She's like, my favorite YouTuber in the entire world is out there and I watch all of his videos. And I was like... Okay, I said, go back there, and I said, and so she goes, she really wants to meet you. Do you care if I bring her over here? And I said, no, not at all. I go, actually, I go, okay, this is what I want you to do. I said, um, I want you to go back there, and I want you to tell her, um, he said that he really appreciated you watching his videos, but that he's a very private person, and he would prefer not to be bothered. <laughs> And so she just looked at me. I go, I'm I go, sweetie, I'm totally joking. I go, go back there and get her and tell her to come up here. So she went and got her and um, she came over and she was kind of shy at first. But then she was like, I was asking her like, where did my chapstick go? Where did I put that? Um, I was like asking her who she watches. And she's like, um, winter storm warning ends. Oh, it came up on my, it came up in my car. I guess the weather comes up in my car. It ends at nine a.m. on Sunday, if anybody would like to know. But, um, 
So I was asking, I was like, who do you watch? And she's like, I literally watch YouTube all day long. She's like, you're like one of my favorite YouTubers. I was like, oh, you are so sweet. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was fun. We had a really good time. They have like these fantastic meals at Maggiano's, okay? So, like you can get, you can share an appetizer so it's called like the like the two for two for something like that. Excuse me. And you each get like it's off the min the middle menu. Excuse me, middle menu. So if you guys don't know what Maggiano's is, Maggiano's is a chain restaurant and it's kind of like an upscale, I would say like Olive Garden. It's it's like kind of I don't know, you feel kind of like in a weird way, like you're sitting in New York City or something, and they play like Frank Sinatra music the whole time. I think it's very, like I love the mood at this place, and it's, it's kind of like weirdly romantic. I don't know how to explain it, but anyway, I love it. So, even though it's a chain, I love it. I do not mind chain restaurants. So, um, so you, they have this meal, and you can get like, you can pick like what you want and you get one and then you can take it home. So you can order and it's only off of certain meals, right? So like Alex got lasagna and then I got fettuccine, but you can take something different home. So if I wanted to take home spaghetti, I could have done that or whatever, right? So you each get like the meal and then one to take home and it's like one just to put in the microwave, it's fantastic. So it's like two for the same price, okay? But then you also can do like the two, two for two for people meal, whatever, which is what we did. And then Melissa and Jason did that. And then, so we got, um, what do you call it? We each got a side salad to start, but we could have got like an appetizer um, to split. This car, why is this car not going? We could have got an appetizer to split, but we got each got a side salad and then we got our meals and then we got to share a dessert. And, um, okay, it slid. Anyway, so I was talking about dessert. But, uh, so yeah, so we got, and then we got dessert. We got cheesecake. So, um, but you get, so you get like, uh, an appetizer or two salads, two main courses for each person, a dessert, and it was like 40 bucks or something, which I think is really, really good. Don't you think that's great? I don't know, I thought it was like a really good price. Because then we have like our meals for tomorrow. Although Alex said that he had talked to Carlos and that Carlos was kind of wanting us to come over tomorrow night. I was like, well, I'm totally down to go over there and just kind of hang out with them and the kids and stuff. Oh wait. Um, I wanna pull in here and show you guys Holly Hawk Hill in a second. But um, I was like, I'm totally down to go over there, but if the weather's bad, I don't wanna drive, they live north. And I was like, I don't wanna drive all the way over there and get stuck there, you know? Okay, so when I was talking about the place that my mom had her 16th birthday party, and Victoria said she had married somebody here, which I thought was so cool. And so this is what it looks like when you pull up, okay? So this is Hollyhock Hill. This place has been here, you guys, literally forever, okay? absolutely packed. You cannot get in this, um, so cute, isn't it? You cannot get in this parking lot. Did you see this parking lot here? Okay. You cannot get into this parking lot to save your life on Sunday or a holiday. And, like, to get reservations for, like, Mother's Day or Easter, you better call, like, months in advance. This is the place where they have, um, like the fried chicken and all that kind of stuff. Since 1928, Holly Hawk Hill Family Dinners. So if you're ever gonna be in Indianapolis for a long time, you should try out Holly Hawk Hill. And yeah, it says right here, total takeout. They do deliveries, or they do uh, takeout too. Well, I guess it says delivery here, I didn't know that, but um, maybe that's something new. I didn't know that they did um, carry out until, how many years ago was this? Well, it was when Alex and I did the, um, the first year that we adopted a family for the United Christmas Service or whatever that place is called because we, um, I don't know, 
I've talked about it on here, but I don't know how much at length. So Alex and I, we adopted a family. Oh God, I don't even know how long ago this was. It was forever ago. We did it, we did it a year, we skipped a year, and then we did it another year, I think. Or maybe we did it three years total, I can't remember. But the first year, we like, um, went above and beyond. And all of our friends like donated stuff to us and donated money and it was just like unbelievable. Like this family, all the stuff that we got for them was so cool. But I wanted to like do something really special for them for like Christmas dinner. And so I went to Hollyhock and um, Hollyhock donated like 10 fam, like 10, we got 10 person family dinner. So they got like um, a turkey and they, you guys, it was unbelievable, okay? I mean, they got like a turkey and rolls and all the sides, like green beans, macaroni and cheese, um, mashed potatoes. I mean, like everything. It was unbelievable. And I went there to go pick it up and they were so nice about the whole thing. I mean, I'm telling you, like this would have been like a couple hundred dollar dinner. I mean, probably like a $400 dinner that they donated. And I picked it up there and like we took it to the family with all the presents and stuff. It was so nice. It was so, so nice. I think sometimes, like, you know, because of my mom, like, being in Gatlinburg that last Christmas when I was on a diet, and, um, I just didn't really care so much, you know, like, because I was eating, like, lean cuisine meals, I didn't, and she really wanted to have a nice Christmas dinner, like, I didn't really think anything about it till after then how much like having a Christmas dinner or a holiday meal like really means you know to a lot of people and I think it's one thing that we really take for granted honestly like we go over to our family's houses and we're like oh like I don't want to have to go over to family dinner but like you know like when I go over to like Caroline's house and or, like Caroline and Mike's house like they do like all the cooking you know like I'm like what do you want us to bring and she's always like you don't have to bring anything don't bring anything oh my god is my library no I was gonna say is the construction done but no She's always like, don't bring anything. We're doing all the cooking, you know? And it's like, I think, you know, to have the money to be able to have a meal like that or to have somebody that's willing to do the cooking, you know, whether it's a pie or macaroni and cheese or mashed potatoes or whatever. I mean, I laugh at it and make jokes, but like at the same time, there's so many people that have no place that are invited to dinner or are homeless or don't have the resources to have that, you know? And I think like, it's things like that that I think in the last couple years, I've really, my eyes have been, you know, awoken to that like gratitude of really realizing I mean it's not like I would sit there at dinner and you know we would say grace or whatever and like I didn't realize that it was awesome that we were having a really nice holiday dinner but I think in the last couple years of my focusing like specifically on gratitude I really really realized it a lot more if that makes sense. And um, I've really, there looks like there's an accident up here or something. I can't tell, I'm not close enough yet. But I've really like, since I practiced gratitude, like more specifically of looking at specific things in my life, it's not just like, oh, I'm grateful for a holiday meal. It's like, I'm grateful for a holiday meal and then like, taking it through. Does that make sense? Like, taking it through to looking at people that don't have the ability to have the holiday meal and those kinds of things. And I think it's important, you know, to look at that. Because then it becomes not just about the holiday meal, it becomes about the everyday meal, the lunch, the clean water, you know, like, um, my, the ability for me to go get Starbucks, you know, like, That's kind of like a luxury, you know? Okay, it slid again, and I had to wait until I was stopped because it fell on the floor. Um, and I was messing with my windshield wipers. I don't even really know what I was talking about at this point. Uh, I was talking about gratitude and just being grateful for those small things. But I think it is, you know, I think it's important, and I talk a lot about gratitude on here because I think for me, like, gratitude has been such an action in my life that has really taught me, you know, truly how blessed I am to really look at that those little small things that really aren't small things to a lot of people and realize how truly blessed I am to have that in my life is like a big deal. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. 
it's really hot in here all of a sudden. But I think that I have to remember that, and I think that gratitude isn't just an action to, um, you know, it's not just about appreciating those things or feeling blessed or lucky or whatever you believe in, you know? But at the same time, it's also about um, a reminder, you know, of where I'm at in life and where other people are at. You know, and I, I believe very much, like I was talking about this in my uh, Peterism's video the other day, is that I, I believe very much in this connectivity, you know, of all of us in the world. And, um, I think gratitude is a good reminder to remember, to, it's a good reminder of where we could be or where we could end up, you know? I think, like, it's interesting, um, when I see, like, like if you're walking down the street and, it, like, I think people often are fearful of, like, homeless people. Like, I've witnessed this, right? And, um, I think, like, it's interesting because, well, I think this gets into a whole different conversation because in Indianapolis, um, one of the reasons why we have the population, the high population that we do of homeless people is because we had the closing of a state hospital, and I'll talk about that in a second, but, um, you know, what's sad about that is, it can happen to any of us, like, it really, really could, you know what I mean? And I think it doesn't seem so much like that, like, when we see somebody maybe, like, pushing a cart down the street, but when you, like, like, when you watch, like, spe specific stories of, like, like, that, that documentary that I watched on Netflix was a good example of that, like, God knows where I'm at, you know, like, it should suffer from major mental health issues, but, on, okay, so do a lot of people, you know, that are able to get some of the mental health needs, their mental health needs met, and if they're not, <laughs> similar things could happen, you know, like, that story is kind of a, it's kind of out there, like, what happens with her, but, you know, you hear these stories of people that, you know, one day were thriving, and they had houses, and they had, you know, food on the table, and they raised their kids, and the next second, it's like, you know, everything just kind of felt, they lost that, you know, they didn't have any health insurance, and, you know, they had to have, they got hospitalized, and then the hospital wanted their money, and, they couldn't afford to pay their bills anymore, and they, you know, it just, it's scary. It's very scary, and, um, I think they are the forgotten people in our country, you know, and the, what's scary about that is that the forgotten people are us. It's us, okay? Like, you know, um, I was watching, like, this this is totally going to swing over, but I was watching 60 Days In a little bit today, and, um, so they were having each of these people talk about kind of, like, their histories, and they had this one woman on there that was talking, and, um, she was saying, like, this was the one that I was identifying last night that they said, like, she's like, I'm a right-wing conservative, and she goes in and says all this stuff, right? And, like, her job title that she's supposed to go in, I mean, I think, I, it's interesting to me that they, like, they pick this to do this because of TV, I get it, right, you know? But at the same time, it's like, are you screwing with people? Are you trying to teach people lessons? Are you really trying to find out what's going on? Because I don't know if this is the way to do it. So anyway, her job is to go and try to, like, uncover, like, all the drugs that are coming into the prison, right? So, when they're interviewing her before she goes in there, where they show her, like, in a shooting range, she says that she has no tolerance for people that use drugs. And that she even had a family member that struggled with using drugs and that she just didn't talk to the family member for 10 years because if they were going to use drugs and she was going to have no part of their life. And, you know, like, okay... Maybe setting boundaries like that to some degree is ad admirable, you know? Like, being able to be, like, that cutthroat, I guess. I don't know. I don't look at that as highly um, admirable, I think. <sighs> you know, I think what people don't understand is, like, like, about addiction is when... Because there's a lot of addicts. There's a lot of homeless people on the streets because they're addicts or alcoholics. We obviously know that, right? We see them a lot of times drinking on the streets. It slid again. I have got... You guys, I have got to get a towel or something. 
Um, I meant to bring one tonight to see if it would just like sit flat on it and maybe like kind of sit up a little bit if I angled it. Um, I think that I can kind of like, like fix it so it'll do that, but I forgot to bring a towel tonight. So anyway, um, you know, I think like, I was saying that there's like a lot of homeless people that struggle with addiction issues, you know, we see them, you know, on the street. But I think like, like this girl was going on and she was talking about that like she doesn't play into that and she thinks that addicts and alcoholics choose to use, like it's their choice whether or not they pick up and whatever, which, okay, yeah, I, there's some truth to that. But I think like what's misunderstood about it is that the disease doesn't have any, and like if I could stress one point to people that don't like really understand the disease concept, well, first of all, I would like suggest Googling the disease concept of addiction and reading an article about it. And, but then I think what's important to understand is that the disease of addiction is like, how can I explain this? Okay, I'm going to use a comparison, just as a comparison to prove a point, but not, or to educate, but not because they're identical, okay? I just want to make sense, I want to make sure that nobody thinks I, what I'm saying is that these two are identical, because they're not. But it's very similar to, like, well, I was going to actually use, I was going to use diabetes, but let's not use that. Let's, let's use um, being allergic to bee stings, Okay. So this is kind of how it is. So let's say if you're allergic to a bee sting and you have like some disease and the disease makes you allergic to bee stings, right? Okay. The disease is in your body long before you're ever stung by a bee or bees are around you or you're hovering around a beehive, whatever. The disease is in you, right? Okay, I think we can all admit that. When a bee stings you, okay, is when certain symptoms come out and things like that. That's when you start reacting to the disease that is in your body. Does that make sense? Okay. But you have the disease inside of you already. So it's like an alcoholic taking a drink or an addict, you know, eating a pill. Very similar to that. But the thing is, is that like once you start comparing them in other ways, like then that example falls apart. So that's why I was like, you know, but... You know, it's similar to like some somewhat similar to like diabetes where if you're taking care of yourself, right? And you're keeping your insulin in check and you're doing all those kinds of things and you're eating the food you're supposed to be eating and you know, whatever and not letting you know your sugars get out of control and all that kind of stuff, then probably you're gonna be pretty healthy. Okay? Just like an alcoholic or an addict, before they ever pick up, if they never pick up in their entire life, an alcoholic or an addict's still gonna have a lot of behaviors, right? That they don't know how to deal with. But if they don't pick up, they have a chance, right? But once an alcoholic or an addict knows that they're an alcoholic or addict and they're going to meetings or they're staying sober some other way that spiritually they've figured out works for them or, you know, they're going to counseling and they've improved their life. And like for me, okay, my medicine is going to meetings, having sober friends, having a sponsor that I work with, doing inventory, things like that. If I'm doing those things, that's my medicine, right? So as long as I'm doing those things, then my disease should be, so to speak, in remission, okay? I shouldn't think about using, I shouldn't, I should be fine to some degree, okay? It's when I'm not doing those things that the way that my disease is going to affect me puts me in danger, if that makes sense. I know people get really upset with when I say, does that make sense? Um, it's a Peterism, it's how I talk. I've said it for years and years and years. Somebody put it on a comment the other day and they were really upset that I said it. And I was like, I don't mean anything by it. I don't mean to talk down to you guys. Like I just, I say it like all the time. Like if I was sitting there at dinner tonight, I probably said it 10 times at dinner. I don't know, it's just like one of those things that you know, we all have those things that we say. But I don't want anybody to think that I'm like, talking down to them. Does that make sense? No, I'm joking. Um, but no, really, I, I don't want anybody to think that. But, you know, it's very similar to that. And um, so I was watching this girl on the show and I was thinking to myself, like, 
are they sending you in there so that you can learn about drugs or are they sending you in there truly because they want you to learn? because if you're if you're going in there and you're already thinking to yourself I have no tolerance for these people that use drugs. I looked at she like you could tell she like looked down on addicts and alcoholics I don't know I, I just I think when we pass judgment on people one of the things we got to remember is how close is that string of connectivity to us to them? Like, I mean, could it be us? Like, could that be our life, you know? In Indianapolis, we had a hospital called Central State Hospital. I don't know when it closed. I would say in the early 90s sometime. It was a psychiatric mental health hospital, like what you imagined back in the day. And, um, very scary. And they actually, like tore down, I think it's all torn down now because they're making like that property into condos or something or housing neighborhood or something, I don't know. But like people would go in there and like do like paranormal investigations and they would like, you know, dare each other to go stay in there every overnight because it was like really scary and stuff like that. But um, what was I gonna say? Well, when Central State closed, because I think it was lack of funding, the time that it closed was when I would have been, it was after I had gotten out, it was before I was in graduate school. So, I graduated in graduate school, God, I think like 98 or 99, I can't remember what year. But, so I would have been in graduate school from like 97 to 99 roughly. So Central State must have closed before then. Well, what happened was they didn't have enough group homes and places to release a lot of these people that were supposedly quote unquote well enough to be on their own. I mean, after years and years and years of being in a state facility, I mean, they were institutionalized. They didn't know how to live on their own. You know what I mean? They had no idea. And so what happened was these people were released, many of which without family and friends, and they ended up on the streets. And it overpopulated the homeless population in Indianapolis, and like our homeless shelters and things like that just couldn't handle it, still can't. Um, so sad, you know? I think no matter how rich or how poor you are in this country, I think uh, good mental health services are hard to come by. I just really do. And I don't think the United States is the only one, you know, like, it, that's like that. I mean, I've watched documentaries on, like, the UK and Australia and how they handle mental health issues, too. And, I mean, I don't know that I think it's a whole lot better than it is, uh, you know, here. And honestly, I mean... And maybe some countries with a better understanding of mental health, maybe the United States is one of those, but like mental health treatment in the country in the United States is so expensive, you know? Like, I think one of the ways we're getting better is, you know, like if you're looking for um, mental health, if you're looking for mental health, you know, services and your low income. You know, every community has a community mental health center. And sometimes it'll take you a month or two to on a waiting list to get in for an appointment, for an evaluation. And they're heavily overloaded, but then you can get a case manager and you can get, you know, into some groups and get a psychiatrist if you need to be on medication. And typically those organizations, you know, community mental health centers will help with the cost of the medication so it's affordable. And we're starting to see more and more of that wraparound services, you know. Um, and I think that's fantastic. I think that's what we need. Um, but, like, I think it needs to ha come from a lot more of, like, referrals from students in schools. So, like, elementary school students that are having parents that are not involved or parents that, you know, like, have been in and out of jails or treatment facilities or, you know, that we know that, like, you know, have gotten, let's say, two or three DUIs and stuff. Like, maybe wraparound services needed to be provided for that family. And we don't need to wait for somebody to call. Like, we need to go in. But the problem is, and this is what I'm talking about, is that the system is so saturated that 
that's not going to happen. I mean, we're, we, it's not like we just have somebody like Susie, Susie Social Worker sitting around going, well, I'm going to go reach out to 50 families today and get new 50 new families, you know, like on my caseload. I mean, it's just, they're already overloaded and underpaid. It's not going to happen, you know? We already don't have the resources for it. So then it's like people get missed through the cracks. And it just is so sad. You know, and then like when you talk about things like and this is where it gets really scary right when we talk about like people that suffer from depression or people that suffer from bipolar disorder or people that you know all this kind of stuff like yeah that's scary like those are like mental health diagnoses that are really really very real and very scary right okay but what if you're talking about somebody that's suffering from schizophrenia <laughs> or like schizoid disorder you know like somebody that like cannot think straight and they're not getting their mental health needs met because they can't afford them. You know, and they're just like out there, they're not getting any of that met. Like, that's really scary, you know? I don't know, it makes me sad. Drug and alcohol treatment is so expensive in this country. Even halfway houses are expensive, you know? It's like we talk about fixing these problems, but we don't really have the resources to fix these problems. I don't know. I try to stay hopeful, you know, that we come up with a better organization or a better system for this. Ah, oh, my leg is hurting from sitting in the same way. I don't know how long I've been vlogging now for. 30, 40 minutes. Um, I finished my book last night. The Hank Green book. I gave it five stars, you guys. It was so good. It ended so good. It was The ending was so good. Um, did not cry. I kind of expected to cry at the end of it, but I didn't cry. Um, it was so fantastic. I would highly recommend that book. Um, what was it called? A truly remarkable thing or a highly remarkable thing or whatever. I think you should rename the book though. I can't remember that title. It saved my life. And I'm now listening to Anne Rule's The Stranger Beside Me, which is this month's true crime book for Peter's Book Club because we're, you know, we're doing a year of true crime. Um, interesting read. Um, I think Anne Rule might have had a little bit of a crush on Ted Bundy. Um, she's kind of she's different this one I don't know what I think about it I know people love her right was this like her first book that she wrote I think it was I'll have to do some research on her um, tomorrow because I want to find out some things I was actually like before I left the house I was like looking at some pictures in the driveway of Ted Bundy because I didn't really know what he looked like you know he and everybody always says like he was so good looking the women just like, oh they swim when they saw him he was kind of good looking honestly not that that takes away from how crazy he was but she goes in there and she talks about like well this one part is so weird and she like worked with him on this crisis hotline and that was like a suicide crisis hotline I'm like sitting in the bathroom getting ready to go to dinner tonight right like I took a shower and I'm like doing my hair and stuff and so I have the audiobook I'm listening to it in the background I'm like pretty much at this point like I'm listening to an audiobook like to any free moment that I have, I'm listening to an audiobook. Like, I'm kind of weirdly obsessed right now. Now, you guys know that I've always liked audiobooks before, but, like, right now, I'm, like, really, really listening to audiobooks. Like, really listening to audiobooks. Like, that Hank Green book, like, if I was in my car. Well, let me just tell you, first of all, okay? So, like, as soon as I get in my car, I, like, hook it up and, like, it's on the right. I mean, like, I'm, like, that's all I listen to is books in my car. If I'm at home, like, I have it and I'm, like, playing it in the background. So, whatever book I'm listening to. I'm so into it right now, listening to audiobooks. And, um, I started reading, well, I got about halfway through that graphic novel that I was showing you guys the other day called, um, 
I was like, I bought a bottle of water last night. What happened to it? And I was like, oh yeah, you drank it today. <laughs> um, that one called Unlovable. It is so hilarious, you guys. It is absolutely so hilarious. And um, there was this part, do you guys ever just like read stuff that just makes you laugh so hard? So Tammy, who's like the main character, she's calling her boyfriend who isn't really her boyfriend, but she thinks it's her boyfriend. She like calls him and every time she calls his mom, it's like, she get, the mom says something different. Her mom is like, her boyfriend's name is Eric, I think. And she's like, um, oh, Eric went to the movies or Eric is doing this or Eric is doing that. And so finally it's like eight o'clock at night and her brother, she and her brother like hate each other, right? And so she asks her brother to call and so he calls and he's like, um, can you tell him to come to the phone and talk to Tammy because she's horny and she wants to, she wants to French or something? And I don't know why. It's so stupid, but it got me laughing so hard. It just was like cracked me up when I read it. I was like, oh my god, this is so hilarious. I put on so much of this like lip balm tonight, but I don't really care. It's really good. Um. Oh, so anyway, with this Ted Bundy thing, I'm like in the bathroom. I'm like getting ready. I'm like doing my hair. I'm like this, and she's like. People will say, because, like, he was, like, really good at this crisis hotline or whatever. And Ann Rule is, like, on the audiobook, she's like, I don't even know if it's her reading it. I think it is. She'll, she goes, people will say that Ted Bundy took a lot of lives, which he surely did. But he also saved many lives, too. And I thought, this chick's lost her shit. Like, seriously? <laughs> like, she's lost her shit, okay? That she is writing this book about a serial killer talking about how he saved lives. Okay, great. I think that's fantastic, okay? I think it might be a little, like, that that might be a little outshined by the fact that he was a serial killer, and Come on! Cracks me up. And then she kind of gets into some personal stuff about herself, and it's like... Like, she, like, shares a little bit, but not a lot. She talks about how she told Ted Bundy that her husband, like, wanted a divorce, and that he found out that, like, they have four kids, right? First of all, she's, like, talking about how she never has time to do this volunteer work and the only night because she had four kids that she had to take care of as a single mom. Four kids she'd take care of as a single mom. And then she talks about how she was a volunteer and I'm like, well, if you were a volunteer, why are you, why don't you stay at home with your kids if it's such a hard issue? And like, it's not like you have to work for, I mean, yes, she has to work to support her kids, but this isn't part of that working gig. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is part, of, this is volunteer work. So, and this is four hours a week. She, but she goes on and on about it, like over and over and over. Like, I don't know. Like, I like the book. I think the book is really interesting. I'm not so fascinated with Anne Rule. She's just a kind of a little bizarre to me as a writer. And then she goes in this whole thing about how her husband had a malignant tumor or something, and then he decided that he wanted a divorce. And she was like, I just, and she goes, one night I just opened up and I talked to Ted, and I was like, Okay, they know each other four hours a week, okay? It's not like they're best friends or anything, and she makes it out like they're kind of like best friends. It's kind of weird. But anyway, and, she, and he's like, well, we're none of us promised, you know, forever, and if you stay with him, it's just a bunch of bullshit. And then she's like, and Ted ended up being right. We got divorced that year. My husband was remarried and, mar and had another four years with his new family, and I thought, what the fuck? Like, this is so weird. Like, <laughs> I'm so confused by what is going on here. <laughs> and I don't care about you, Ian Rule. I don't want to hear about Ted Bundy. So anyway, but now I'm like completely entranced to it. I'm like over two hours into it and I'm like really, really into it. Which is good because I only have um, <laughs> 16 hours left something roughly around 16 hours of this audiobook, which I listened to it at two times speed, so that's eight hours that I have left to listen to it. <laughs> I haven't been to Applebee's forever. Did I not just say that on a vlog the other day when I was like by this other Applebee's? I think I did. I'm really thirsty. I want a bottle of water and I don't want to stop. I don't want a pickle. I just want to ride on my motorcycle. If 
you guys have never seen, because I haven't talked about this on a long, in a long time on here, if you have never seen Little Girl Blue about Janis Joplin um, on Netflix, it should still be on Netflix, and it's fantastic. It is, like, hands down one of the best um, documentaries of life. I love that documentary so much. I just passed a liquor store. You know, I just sometimes don't even have any kind of, like, realistic clue as to what, like, liquor costs anymore. And I really don't remember what liquor cost when I drank back in the day. Um, somebody was asking me, like, in a and a because I just put questions up on Instagram a couple nights ago. Oh my God, you guys, I got like 164 questions. I couldn't even believe it. It was like crazy. I like counted it. I wanted to know how many exactly I had. And um, it's like 160 or 164. I was like counting them by twos because um, cause like when they show up, they show up like this. And I was just like screenshotting them. I was like, how many questions did I get? I got a lot more questions than usual. Um, but what was I saying? Oh, one of the questions I got on a Q&A, I don't remember when the Q&A was, but like, what did you drink when you drank? And I thought it was kind of like such a strange question. I must not talk about it on here, but I think like on my vlog, I talk about it quite a bit that I used to drink like 40s. I would get up and drink a 40, you know, but like I loved like my drink was Jack and Coke. And um, like when I would go to a bar, like the first in the evening, I would get a double shot of Jack and a Jack and Coke. That was how I started. Or sometimes like a double shot of Jack and a beer. Just depended on how slow I wanted to take the evening, really. Um, I think back on that, it's like crazy thinking. Yeah, I wanted to take the evening slow, so I had a double shot of Jack and a beer, you know. Um, I can still, like right now as I'm talking about it, I can like oddly kind of conjure up the taste or smell of Jack Daniels. Um, I always, I mean, well, I, I can't, there's a lot of alcohols that I can still kind of like smell to this day, if that makes sense. Like, um, and maybe it's because I've smelled it on other people, but like with Jack Daniels, I don't really know any Jack drinkers. Um, beer, but I'll tell you the weird thing is, okay, that whenever I think about like drinking, like, oh, it would be nice to have a drink or whatever. Like sometimes with Alex, I think because Alex, you know, drinks red wine, I think like that would be nice. Um, but like Alex is a, like, if he goes out with his friends, like he drinks like vodka waters, okay? I like that doesn't sound desirable to me at all. That sounds like sucking on a lime is what it tastes like. Ugh, ugh, I can't, uh uh. Um, I, I really, to be honest with you, like whenever I talk about like, whenever I think about cravings, like if Tanya and I are talking about it or whatever, I'll be like, do you ever crave something? Like, you know, she's like, I mean, she'll be like, yeah, absolutely, I do. And I'm like, what do you crave? What's so weird is I crave beer. Like, that's it. And not, like, these, I, what is it, IPAs and all these fancy beers. Like, I don't crave all that. Like, I crave, like, cheap-ass beer. I don't know why. It's so weird to me. I also don't, like, I get, like, every once in a while, like, on this Q&A that I got somebody asking about medical marijuana, it's, like, one of the reasons why no matter the legalization of marijuana or not. One of the reasons, okay, you guys, it stopped, and I have no idea where it stopped. I was talking about, um, like, the only thing that I really miss, drinking-wise, is, like, I have, the only thing I ever think about is, like, beer, and then I was talking about how, um, like, one of the reasons why, like, even if marijuana was legalized, I couldn't smoke it was because I used to smoke it all day, every day. Like, the fact that it being legal has nothing to do with me. And I do want to say this, that um, I, I have no issues with medical marijuana whatsoever, as long as it is, you know, prescribed, I guess, by a physician. I don't know how I really feel about all of that. I mean, Indiana hasn't really been affected by it, and I don't really read a lot of articles about it, in all honesty, because it just doesn't affect my life. And 
What I do believe is that we have way too many people that are incarcerated in prison systems for marijuana. You know, people that like have violated probation and parole because of smoking pot. That I think we are, we they don't need to be there for that. Um, that is one of the things I feel very, very strongly about. Um, I think before medical marijuana is taken real seriously, we're going to have to destigmatize marijuana. Um, but for me, it doesn't really matter if it's legal or not. I mean, like, alcohol is legal, right? Like, I can go into a liquor store tonight. Well, not now, because the liquor store's closed. But um, but I could go into a liquor store, and I could spend $1,000 on liquor, right? Just because it's legal doesn't mean that I don't, like, it doesn't mean that I don't have a problem with it. Like... Yeah, it's legal, and I still have a huge problem with alcohol. So, just because marijuana is legal doesn't mean I'm not going to have a problem with it. Does that make sense? Like, and I think this is the trap that a lot of people get into. It's like I've had so many friends of mine that got, you know, hooked on painkillers. Legal. Like, I mean, they went to the doctor. The doctor prescribed them painkillers. You know, and the doctor would say, well, like, I mean, if it hurts a little bit, like, take another one. You know, it's not that big of a deal. And then over a course of six months, they're absolutely hooked on it, you know? And um, they can't get off. And I think it's scary as shit. And so... They didn't break the law. You know, they did what they were told to do by their doctor and things like that. That's a huge epidemic in our country right now that we don't talk about, you know, is a medically induced addiction, I think. It's like a huge issue, you know? And, but so just because something's legal doesn't mean that you can't be addicted to it. And I think that's a, like a real misunderstanding sometimes, you know, that like, well, I mean, once marijuana is legal, that doesn't mean, I mean, I can't, you know, then it's not, I can't be addicted to it. Well, that's not the case. And it's definitely not the case for me. You know, it's going to be interesting when I go somewhere where they have, like, cannabis shops. or Because I haven't been anywhere since th they've been around. Um, I haven't been somewhere, like, where they've had them. Not that I'm aware of. And, like, if, you know, all of a sudden we had them in Indiana. Like, we're starting to see, like, and I know it's not the same thing, but, like, CBD shops, right? Like, if that was, like, a cannabis shop... Like, it would be hard for me, out of curiosity, not to go inside and want to see what it is. But at the same time, like, I don't need to be in liquor stores. I have no business being in a liquor store, okay? You know, you hear people joke about, like, in meetings that one of the ways that they relapsed was by being in a liquor store. And they'll go, people will say, like, well, why were you in a liquor store? And they'll say, um, well, I was buying my lottery tickets or I was buying a pack of cigarettes, well, why did you have to go to the liquor store to buy your lottery tickets or a pack of cigarettes? Well, I just always went to... Well, you don't have to go there, you know? Um, I think I could probably count on one hand the times I've been in a liquor store since I've been sober. 24 years. I can count on one hand the times... I have no business being in a liquor store. You know? It's a rare occasion that I buy alcohol for somebody. You know, if I'm feeling generous, I might buy my husband a glass of wine if we're out to dinner, but, you know, I just don't typically buy alcohol for people, especially if I'm at it at like a bar, like I never do. And that's not because I have an issue with other people drinking. It's just because I'm not going to, like, I don't need to spend my money contributing to somebody else's drinking. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't drink, so why would I do that today? But I think it would be hard, you know? And I hear, like, God, I hear, like, I'm the first one. Like, when somebody tells me that they went to, like, oh, they'll be like, oh, I went to Colorado and they went to a cannabis store. I'll be like, what do they have in there? Do they have Butterfingers? Do they have gummy bears? What do they have? Like, I'm, like, the first person to ask a thousand questions, right? That exactly right there is why I have no business being in one. Because I'm still like a kid in a candy store when it comes to drugs and alcohol. I am, you know? I'll always be that way. Tanya and I, we haven't done it in a long time, but like, you know, we would walk down every once in a while down the liquor aisle, like at Walmart or something, and we'd be like, holy shit. Like, I mean, we did not have this stuff when we were drinking. This is unfair. You know what I mean? I mean, they have this liquor that is in like these little like moonshine glasses that looks so fun. It's like some kind of whiskey that looks so fantastic because it comes in these like, did you guys, it looks like Everclear. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Or they have different flavors of this Everclear, which who'd wanted flavor in Everclear anyway, but, um, 
you know, like Mike's hard, hard Mike's hard lemonade. What this is the one all my friends laugh at me about because they're like, if you went back out there and you could only try, try one thing, what would it be that was new? And I'm always like, Mike's hard lemonade. Like I have, I, I just have this belief system that it has to. I know you guys are laughing because like so many of you out there, have, you drank them or had them or whatever. But I just have to believe that it's like the most finest tasting lemonade in the face of the earth. See how you think it's an alcoholic? It's real sick, right? It's real sick. So, I mean, I don't consciously think about that on a regular basis. You know, and like me kind of like, like tonight talking about it isn't going to set me in this tailspin where I'm like, oh my God, I have to have a drink or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I think about that sometimes. I'm like, what would it take me to drink? Like, what would have to happen? It is so hot, you guys, in this car. I, like, turn the heat off and everything. It is so hot. Um, how do I... Please hold a second. Climate. <laughs> you know, like, I used to think, well, if I lost one of my parents, I'll drink over that. And then I lost my mom, and I didn't drink over that. I didn't even think about it, you know? And then I thought, like, you know, with, I think, my last two breakups, well, you know, if we broke up, like, I probably would drink. I probably couldn't handle it. By the time I got with Alex, I didn't think that way. Like, I didn't think, like, you know, like, oh my God, you guys, my hip is driving me crazy in this car. I, I, by that time, I didn't think, like, if Alex and I, you know, break up, like, um, I'm gonna drink. Like, I just didn't go there in my head, if that makes sense. Um, oh, hold on a second, it's gonna go on the radio. Um, oh. During December. There's my uh, audiobook, but I didn't think that way. Um, now, I could imagine periods where I would, like, be like, or I would go through periods where I would imagine, like, I can't, I don't know what my life is going to be like if I don't have Alex in my life. But, like, I had done so much work on myself by the point that I got to, with Alex that I also knew kind of, like, well, you're going to be okay. Like, whether you're single or whether you're with somebody, like, you're going to be okay. Um... And, you know, like, I think I knew that my recovery wasn't contingent upon that. Plus, my first couple years with Alex, I wasn't going to meetings. Like, I wasn't working a program, you know? Like, those were the years that I was, uh, like, went, you know, didn't go to meetings and then I came back in. Um, so, I think that played a factor into all of that. But you know, like, when I look at my friends that have relapsed and gone back out there, it wasn't huge stuff. You know, it was, they stopped going to meetings, they stopped having sponsors, they stopped doing service work, you know, giving back, they stopped, um, and meetings were a huge part of it. They stopped taking care of themselves. They started saying things like, oh, I don't need a 12-step program, or, those people don't really understand me. Um, I don't need that anymore, you know? Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, how long do you need to go to 12-step meetings? And you know, the thing is, I was always taught that you go for the rest of your life. You know, that it's like you're constantly taking your medication. Do you need to go to 14 meetings a week? No. Are there people that have 40 years sober that go to 14 meetings a week? I'm sure. You know, it's kind of like, what do you need? You know, probably I would recommend always one, like two meetings a week, you know, for somebody with long-term sobriety, because I think when you're going to one meeting a week, like I learned, it's really hard to back away from one meeting a week when you're just going to one and you stop going to that one, then you're not going to any anymore. You know what I mean? Um, the people that, the, the men and the women that I am friends with today that have what I want in their lives, peace, serenity, compassion, understanding, kindness, healthy relationships, accomplishing dreams, you know, they have the, they have the lives that I want, 
I do what they do. And these are people that have 40, 50 years sobriety and they're 30, 40, 50 years of sobriety and they're still going to meetings. And so I was always taught, you know, when you see somebody that has what you want, do what they do. And I will continue to do that, I hope, for the rest of my life. Um, I think, like, what happened with my friends, I don't believe was a conscious decision. I don't believe that one day they just said, well, I'm going to leave, you know, going to meetings, and I'm going to start drinking. It didn't happen like that at all. It was, ah, uh, Sliderella. <laughs> Sliderella camera. Um... You know, but when I look at, like, my friends that have gone back out, like, it, I don't believe that it was a conscious decision, you know? Like, and I, you know, with my friends that have gone back out there, we haven't had those conversations. And I think there's a lot of lack of awareness to how serious it is, which makes me sad. And I'm not going to, you know... get into their personal stories, but it just, it didn't start with, like, a full-fledged relapse, let's just put it that way, it was a little bit of this, well, you know what I mean, like, it was just, one day I'm not going to meetings, and this, and then, oh, I don't really need that in my life anymore, and then over time, and then all of a sudden their lives became about all that, you know, and it's like, okay, take notes, Peter, because if it's gonna happen to you, this is how it's gonna happen, you know, it's gonna be a slow, spiral, you know, into a relapse, like, and, you know, I was always taught that, you know, I, hell, in treatment, you know, as a counselor, I taught that, that, you know, a relapse takes a long time sometimes, it doesn't just go like that, you know, like, we would, like, we would do these, it's called an unpacking, with people that had had relapses, and we would say, okay, well, here's where you picked up, right, but, like, where did the relapse actually start, well, the relapse started, you know, we would go back, like detail by detail by detail to go figure out really what, where did it actually start? You know, and people would be mesmerized, you know, to, to see that it started, you know, sitting at home one night and all of their friends the next day at work would be talking about American Idol and they didn't get to watch American Idol because they, you know, um, had to go to a meeting and they were resentful that they weren't like everybody else. And this resentful, resent, this resentful, this resentment, you know, like I make, this is, I'm totally making this story up. This is a made up story, right? But like this resentment, this unfulfilled expectation of how the world should treat them and who they should be in the world led six months later to them picking up, you know, a drink or using or whatever. And it's scary when we think that way. Oh my gosh, you guys, my leg is killing me right now. I don't know why. Um, it's really scary because it could happen then to any of us is what we know, you know, like as people in recovery. And that's why you have to stay on top of it. I always hold out hope for people, though, you know? And I remember one of the things that my sponsor would say to me, back my old sponsor, you know, I would say something about somebody that I, like a friend of ours that had gone back out, and I'd say, I hope they make it back in. And he would say, well, that's a nice thought, but that's not really your decision. And I'd say, what do you mean? And he'd say, you know, that's really God's decision. And, you know, um, maybe God has a different plan for them. You know, maybe God has a plan for them to find it a different way. Or maybe God has, you know, the plan is for them to be exactly where they're at right now. You know, that was really how I started really understanding the idea of um, wherever you are is exactly where you're supposed to be right now in the journey of your life. And, like, starting to really understand that, you know? Um, I, 
blessed to know people don't make pivotal changes in their life or profound changes, pivotal changes, profound changes in their lives unless they, you know, had enough pain, I think, when it comes to addiction. And um, I think that's sad commentary, but I think that's the reality and that's called hitting our bottoms. A lot of times we're choosing our bottoms, you know, where we have to like have gone through so much pain to get to that point where we're just like, yeah, we don't want to go through it anymore. You know what I mean? Oh my God, my leg, you guys. It's really sore. I wish I had gotten water now back at that gas station. I could have gotten out and like walked around the car for a little bit. This vlog tonight has gone up and down, up and down. It's been like funny, happy, sad, introspective. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's gone up and down, up and down, up and down. I have got to pull over and like, hold on just a second. I've got to pull over and just like stretch my leg for a second because this is like hurting so bad. I really don't want to get out on the side of the road. And, but. Oh, wow. Okay. A nerve hit or something. Like, I don't know. It just really hurts in my leg. I think I'm going to. I was going to turn around up here, but there's a roundabout up here. I'll just go to the roundabout and turn around. I'm not going to talk much longer anyway. So yeah, so that's why I, you know, continue to go to meetings is because those people that I see that, you know, have peace of mind, they have serenity, they have those things that I want, you know, or like those, the, like my sponsor, you know, I mean, she's extremely involved, you know, in recovery and she has a really, really active life outside of sobriety, you know, and, um, she always has stuff going on. She's always traveling, doing this, doing that. I mean, she's always got stuff going on, right? And, um, why is it cutting my, oh my God, my battery just came on. I can't believe it. Um, I may have just figured out how to fix my camera. It's kind of like wedged in between my windshield and that. So, you know, and she has a really fun life. Like, she has a great life. And, you know, I think, like, she's somebody that is a perfect example of having what I want, if that makes sense. And so, if I want what she has, I have to do what she does. And she's somebody that's very active. And she's somebody that works steps. And she's somebody that does inventory. And she's somebody that goes to meetings. And, you know, like, those are the things that I do because I see that it works for her. And I want what she has. And there are a lot of people like that, you know? And, um, I mean, I think in life, it doesn't have to just be in sobriety, but in life, if we look at people as role models that, and I'm not, I mean, you can look at things like financial things or whatever, but I think sometimes, you know, obsessive search for, you know, like uh, the financial things. I don't know. It's kind of makes me sad sometimes. Um, I like nice things too. I just don't want to become consumed by it. But when you find people that have like a, a, a way to themselves of how they are, how they handle situations, you know, see what they do. Do what they do. Ask them what they do. How do you stay so calm? You know, what do you do that makes you so relaxed or so kind or so loving on it? What do you do? Like, teach me that, you know? And they can teach us their tricks. And I think it's important for us to have role models. I think it's important for us to have mentors and people that inspire us, you know? And people that uh, we can look up to and people that we can follow as guides on this journey of life, you know, to do what they do because we want what they have. And, you know, for me, like, 29 year, tw 29 year, 2019 is really, I can feel it going to be a spiritual year for me in a positive way. Like, I really want to travel a lot and I want to see the world and I really want to be focused on serenity, peace, you know, and all of that because that's what I have learned in the last few months that is just, like, vital to me. And I'm seeking out people that have that. And those people that seem to have that are the people that I want closest to me, you know? So anyway, and I, I, I think that, I don't know. Those are just attributes to me today that are like, to 
have peace of mind, somebody that just wakes up every day with peace of mind, like, that's what I want. I want to achieve that, you know? So, <sighs> or at least achieve getting on the road to being there, right? Because I don't know that we're ever going to pr practice that perfectly, so. Anyway, oh, this was the like most rambly vlog tonight, you guys. I'm going to get off here, and my battery's about to stop. I can't believe it's gone this long, actually, since it's been flashing forever. Um, I'm going to get off here, and um, I'll try to vlog more throughout the day tomorrow, depending on if I can get out of the house because of the snow and ice. Uh, we probably won't get, end up getting anything. That's what happens in Indianapolis. I want a blizzard. <laughs> anyway, I love you guys, and I will see you tomorrow. I hope you're having a fantastic weekend. Bye.